All right, everybody, uh, good morning to you all. Uh, today we have the pleasure of uh, a little different subject rather than otology. Um, we're going to have a lecture on head and neck surgery in Ethiopia. Today's guest lecture is, is Yilika, personal friend and colleague in Ethiopia who trained in uh, Egypt. Uh, he's Ethiopian, but he did train in Egypt, came back to Ethiopia, has been there for a number of years. Originally, um, he went to uh, at the city called Mekele in the north, uh, was head of the ENT department there, and has subsequently now relocated to Addis Ababa, the capital. So with that introduction, um, I think we're gonna be uh, exposed to some very interesting cases and uh, uh, the lecture from Dr. Yulika. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Richard. So uh, <clears throat> it has been said, my name is uh, Ilika Zamana from uh, Ethiopia. So I'm a head and neck surgeon in St. Paul's Hospital in uh, Addis Ababa, which is the capital. So uh, in the, this presentation, I'll try to clarify some points, like uh, the, just we'll start with the introduction part, uh, end practice in Ethiopia, how the current practice looks like, how is our postgraduate program uh, going on and when it started? And then I will focus more on head and neck surgery. So uh, we'll see the human resource in head and neck surgery, the scope of practice and uh, what's different from the Western practice and the challenge, the opportunities and uh, the way forward. So this will be my objectives. So to begin with, uh, I'll try to uh, be on time. So to begin with, uh, the country has, Ethiopia has got around 120 million people. That's the estimate. So we are waiting for a new census. And uh, for this, uh, we had like the NT practice as a specialty had been there uh, since the 70s, late 70s or early 80s. Otherwise, before that, it was the case were managed by uh, the pre-existing uh, specialists like internal medicine, general surgery, and pediatrics. So, and this, the end people starts to come, uh, train abroad and come back and uh, starts uh, to give some services. And uh, surprisingly, we didn't have uh, special training uh, till 2008, which is roughly uh, 12 or 13 years back. And by then we had uh, less than uh, 15, otolaryngologists in the country, which all of them are uh, a graduate from uh, abroad, Germany, Cuba, Russia, and uh, Greek, by then the socialist countries. Otherwise, so you can imagine 15 otolaryngologists for uh, maybe there we may have like 80 million people. That's, that's uh, incredible. And then it starts to have, for this uh, specialized program to be started, uh, the lion share is, uh, is taken by really Dr. Richard Wagner, who uh, who sacrificed time, energy. I mean, he has been through all ups and downs, but he succeeded to start the program, uh, the postgraduate program in uh, Addis Ababa. I think by then the Minister of Health was uh, current uh, WHO uh, General Director, Dr. Tero Sadano. So. Knocking all the doors to make this happen. Then the Addis Ababa University Medical Faculty starts the residency program, 2008, and they take only they took only three candidates. Actually, one of the candidates uh, left, and uh, only two candidates uh, managed. I mean, at the end, finished the training. And then, uh, despite all these gaps, despite all this need. Uh, there were only very few applicants. Uh, I will come to the uh, to the uh, reason. So later on in 2015 and 16, Saint Paul's Hospital, where I am working now, and uh, Macaulay University, starts the uh, postgraduate program. Uh, uh, then, so how does the current practice looks like? Well, we are in the 21st era, but still uh, it's in the infancy stage, the, our practice. The other disciplines like general surgery, internal medicine, pediatrics, and other parts, I mean, 
they they are really doing good in terms of their depths of practice, in terms of uh, the human power they have, in terms of their collaborations, uh, their program, right, their program they're running and the like. But when it comes to ENT, it's a relatively a new discipline for the country. So well, we are going to have so many uh, uh, complaints about the, the discipline in terms of human power, resource, and the like. <clears throat> And still the services are available. Well, before like before nine, 10 years, the service were all in Addis Ababa, which is the capital of the capital city of the country. But then it starts, you know, people graduate and starts to move outside of uh, Addis, outside of the capital, but still in the cities, like the capital of the regional states. So uh, in the medical schools and so, Mostly, even currently, you find anti surgeons in, in the big cities and the medical school, not everywhere else. Just to see, that is I view on the current practice. Like, like let me say some points on otology. The common case that we see in the clinic is, uh, of course, ear, which is a special chronic separate otitis media. Professor Wagner has uh, I mean, a lot of experience uh, about the ear in Ethiopia. He has been here for long, and there are also others. So uh, we have, even currently, we have a backlog of like a year. We have 400 patients waiting for, 300 patients waiting for tympanoplasties and mastoids. So you can see how much demanding uh, it is. So the current end surgeons usually we do tympanoplasties, especially type one and type two tympanoplasties. And there are some surgeons who, are, who comfortably do mastoid surgery, mastoidectomies, and very few uh, practice stepidotomies. Uh, so the new graduates, even now, they are comfortable in doing uh, tympanoplasties. Of course, the outcome is different for different surgeons and uh, depending on the experience and uh, teaching uh, uh, exposure. Currently we have, officially we have only one temporal bone lab uh, in the country, which is located in uh, Mekale University. It's open, officially inaugurated uh, two years back by the president of uh, the university. And uh, it was opened by the global entity outreach. Uh, and we gave one course for few residents and uh, attendees, and we have even uh, attendees from, uh, I mean, participants from uh, from the from East Africa. So we have had, I think, so by like, in a program we can uh, accommodate for uh, 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 trainees. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, concerning the ear surgery, uh, there is uh, one uh, professor called Professor Miriam. She's from Chicago, University of Illinois. So the program was started like a fellowship, but you know, because there is no otologist staying with the fellows, it's just campaign based one. So it's not like a fellowship, but she produced middle ear surgeons, like we have now five. But it's pretty good. I mean, they managed to do middle surgeries comfortably, deep plastics, mastoidectomies, and some of them even uh, do uh, step surgery, uh, stepidotomies uh, routinely. So it, it, it contributes, it adds to the pool of uh, autologists, and uh, we are thankful. But it's not approved as a fellowship for the above reason. And it's not like it doesn't involve uh, skull based surgeries, and it's just concentrated on middle surgeries. But it's a uh, going on program, but because of COVID, it has been like more than a year since the program is halted. Uh, uh, we have three head and neck fellowship trained in surgeons, uh, two were trained in South Africa with Professor Fagan, and one is trained in uh, Cameroon. In, the program of the Pan African Christian uh, College of Christian uh, Societies. And uh, we have one pediatric end surgeon, again, who is from, uh, he's trained in uh, South Africa. Otherwise, we don't have uh, other fellowship trained uh, end surgeons in the country. So usually it's run by 
general entries. Still, because of the because we don't have uh, rhinologist caliber surgeon, we don't have a real fellowship trained otologists. So most of the cranial skull base uh, uh, pathologists are approached still transcran transcranially uh, because uh, we have, I mean, we are lagging behind doing uh, uh, endoscopic surgeries and uh, ear surgeries going to the skull base. But there are some colleagues who try to overcome this problem, getting experience by themselves and uh, try to go to the skull base. Even though with some complications, some of them are uh, successful, but still, I cannot say that uh, we do them comfortably. So there are so many organizations and individuals uh, which are helping us to make our practice more wide and deep. And uh, to mention some of them who has been with, uh, with us and with the NT society in the country. Uh, global NT outreach has been there since even my uh, since during even my residency. So it has been more than ten years. The hearing loss prevention in Ethiopia, which is run by uh, uh, Dr. Richard Kelly, very nice guy. He's in Upstate University in uh, in uh, Syracuse, uh, 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 New York, and healing the children which is run by uh, Professor uh, Glenn Isaacson, who is also uh, coming frequently like twice a year to augment our practice to teach us, uh, you know, to transfer some skills and also uh, donations. So these organizations and individuals, they, they don't only donate uh, the equipments, uh, the consumables, but the usual, actually they focus on transferring skill to uh, the local staff so that it's just like the with the principle of training the trainers so that we can train our uh, residents and colleagues so uh, these three are like they're in the uh, in the mind of every every ant uh, surgeon in the country uh, so uh, you know the attendees they, 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 there is like two generation of uh, in search in the country. There is a generation who are trained in who trained abroad and come back and were struggling to start the service and uh, to develop the service. And uh, there is also the new generation who has been trained here and then practicing here. So there is a gap of more than 10 years or 15 years in between. Uh, there was no train, there was no in search in between. So there is a bimodal gap, like uh, there are, there is the very experienced generation and there is uh, the new generation. So the new generation who are really practicing in most of the universities and uh, hospitals, who are more in the learning curve, you know, surgery specialties, uh, it's a thing that we know or that we learn through time. So first on the learning curve and uh, there is limitation of equipment. It's not only limitations actually, when something gets broken or uh, dysfunction, then we don't have a competent biomedical engineer to, uh, to solve this problem. So that's very challenging. Despite, you know, shortage of equipment, having what you have, having the, having a malfunction of what you have, uh, uh, what you have been practicing with is another uh, challenge. Consumables, even gel forms, it's a problem. So we usually get it from uh, our colleagues, our partners, which I mentioned uh, above. And there are also some organizations like CBM who also uh, it's in uh, with, uh, especially with the autology, with the ear, ear and uh, hearing and ear care projects. There are tables, still it's a problem. You find only very few uh, tables per week. So we have a lot of backlogs. Uh, even we cannot use our uh, few insurgents uh, efficiently. So it's also a challenge. Just to see you some, uh, to introduce you some of them. This is uh, the healing, I mean, uh, hearing loss prevention Ethiopia president, uh, 
Dr. Richard Kelly, a very selfless, very nice guy. And this is Sam, Dr. Sam Woods, he's also an otologist. They have been here for more than 10 years. Dr. Naga is here, he is the Geo Ethiopia uh, director, and um, he has been, I mean, in practice, in the private practice, and also in the, uh, as an adjunct professor in the universities. So this is, uh, again, another uh, 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 colleague. His name is uh, Jerry Altman, Dr. Jerry. He's from, from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So these three are the groups of uh, the hearing gross prevention in Ethiopia. They are usually, they, I mean, without these guys, the NT practice, especially in Mekale University and Hawassa University wouldn't have been started from the very beginning. They, they brought equipment, including micro, operating microscopes, they teach us and then, you know, they just give us the heads up. So, I mean, I cannot thank them enough. So up to the postgraduate programs, as, we have, as I've said in the first slide, we, have, we had a very few applicants uh, in, the, in the first two or three years. And the whole reason is about awareness. Because during our medical school, most of us were not, you know, we didn't take the NT, the NT uh, course as, uh, I mean, appropriately. We didn't take it appropriately. So it was either just a lecture. So we didn't see much of uh, the procedures. We didn't see how wide NT is. We didn't see the things who are involved, which are involved in the NT practice. So because of, uh, because of those things, people were not interested about ENT. So nobody wants to uh, devote his life for something that he doesn't know. So we had only very few applicants, three, four, a couple of them anyways. But later on when the medical school starts to have ENT surgeons and then when it starts to give uh, the proper ENT course for the undergraduate students, when they see what the NT surgeons do in the OR, do to the, in the clinic and uh, during the consultations around, then the awareness becomes like, it's getting you know, higher and higher. And then uh, nowadays it's one of the most competitive disciplines to get into uh, the residency program. Like for example, this year we had for the spot of uh, 12 spots in the country for ENT residents we had around 300 applicants. So you can see how much uh, competitive it becomes. So there are three institutions which gives uh, training. Uh, Addis Ababa University starts 2008, then Macaulay University and St. Paul in Addis Ababa uh, started, uh, uh, yeah, started later on. The program takes four years. So, I mean, it looks like if, if you take the British system, it looks like it's very short. It's short because uh, as to my understanding, the, for example, in Britain, it takes like eight years to be an end surgeon, whereas in the States, it, has, it, it will be five years. So what matters is our curriculum. The scope of practice, I mean, the curriculum, the, the, the depth of the curriculum that we have, how much committed we are, to make that curriculum, I mean, to really follow the curriculum and the human power, the, the attendees that we have, how much experience are there to follow the curriculum. So considering that, considering the, you know, the, 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 the skill and the human power that we have, force looks quite enough to give, I mean, to teach them uh, at least the basics of uh, ENT. And then uh, the rest of it would be, it will be, uh, you know, something that they will uh, uh, learn through time with uh, experience. But still, with four years, they will be able to do, you know, like tympanoplasties, endoscopic laser surgeries, and laryngeal procedures, and some hair and neck procedures. So it's not uh, that much short here. And it includes actual research. It's a must to have uh, one research uh, as a fulfillment. So their exam is uh, every year, uh, except third year. They will be assessed every year. But usually, the, the higher mark is like 60% of them, 60% uh, of 
their assessment is a progressive one. So they will be evaluated. Uh, they will get the feedbacks and they will get evaluated and then they will be promoted, promoted accordingly. So before uh, now, I mean, before this time we had, we didn't have this uh, uh, harmonized okay. curriculum. So three of them, three of the, 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 three of the institutions has different curriculums, had different curriculums, but now it's harmonized and uh, uh, starting from this year, uh, we are using the harmonized curriculum. So we have one curriculum and then the residents go to anesthesia department, plastics, maxillofacial, oncology for further, uh, you know, augmenting their knowledge about uh, those disciplines because we don't have facial plastic surgeons in the country. They will go and attach with uh, uh, general plastic surgeons, but they will get, you know, the, at least the treatment, I mean, the knowledge, some knowledge. So this is our temporal bola back uh, in Mecca University. Uh, this is, uh, as most of you may know, this is uh, Mr. Jeremy uh, Levy, who is a consultant otologist in, uh, uh, in London. And uh, this one is Misha, who is uh, president of the GEO UK, who has been doing marvelous jobs uh, in, uh, I mean, throughout the, our partnership uh, with GEO and Michael University. So they, they brought everything, the microscope, the drills, the, uh, even the holder for the, the temporal bone, everything is uh, there. Just what, what we did in the hospital is just to give them a room. So they even designed it uh, themselves. So we are very much thankful. And uh, the one on the left is the GEO, I mean, GEO Spain team, uh, Dr. Carlos and his team. I think in front chair, there's Dr. Naga, and then uh, just next to Dr. Naga, there is uh, Dr. Uh, Marta Sandova, a very nice, talented uh, teacher. Uh, she's a very good mentor. And uh, Joe, UK, Joe, Spain, they have been doing uh, uh, with us for a long time. And this is uh, Dr. Josh Widerman. He is now in uh, uh, Minnesota, in Mayo Clinic in Rochester. But he was I mean, selfless enough to spend one year uh, with us in, uh, in McAllen University. And he really, really changed our practice. Like for example, two of the things that I really want to mention is one thing is airway management, pediatrics and adult airway management. He has really teach us from the scratch. And by the time he left, I mean, the senior residents and the attendees were comfortable enough to do bronchoscopes, foreign body removals, and the like, which, which is a new thing for our ENT practice. And that, this is the picture of uh, Dr. Josh Widerman, who is one of the neurosurgeons uh, who were doing the transnasal, uh, uh, I think, pituitary tumor uh, removal. So with a team approach. And uh, that was the first time, actually, uh, that's we have this procedure in uh, in Macaulay. So he has been doing a uh, lot of things, and uh, on this thing we see the residents as well as uh, Josh uh, Wider. So, I mean, there are so many people, but some of them are like uh, they really, really touched uh, our practice. I mean, they changed our practice much. Yeah, let me go to the head and neck. Uh, uh, surgery briefly. I mean, I will try to be on time. So the head and the neck before a few years, um, maybe like before five, six years or before that, uh, head and the neck was kids, they were managed by end surgeons. Actually, even currently it's managed by end surgeons, general surgeons, there are plastic surgeons, oral maxillofacial surgeons and others like vascular surgeons and general oncology surgeons who do that or who practice head and neck uh, uh, surgeons. But mainly, I mean, like before five years or six years, even the head and neck surgery, in terms of scope of practice, it was under the general surgeon's practice. So if I do thy thyroidectomy, maybe eight years back, and if I get like if somebody sue me, then definitely
the, I mean, the awareness of this head and neck thing was, uh, it was like, it was, it was weird. So people think that otolaryngology is about the ear, the nose and the throat. So head and neck, they thought it was out of the uh, program. But when the, our seniors start to come back and practice uh, head and neck part and uh, with uh, additional uh, push from the society, from our ENT society, then nowadays it's in the, in the, I mean, the respective uh, office, they put the, the general surgery, I mean, the head and neck practice under uh, ENT as well. So we are now legally protected to do uh, head and neck surgeries. Otherwise, it, it was not like that before a few years. And, uh, you know, when you do head and neck surgery, special oncology surgeries, there are auxiliary fields which you really, really need, like speech pathologists, prodontics, dietitians, which you don't have. We have a speech pathologists, but I think there are a couple of them, and they practice more on the uh, uh, on the cleft palate patients rather than the, our head and neck patients. Prostodontics, there, may, there, there are few, but still not enough. And there is, I don't know any dietitian who makes rounds or who is available in the hospitals. You may see them in the office, but if they are not for patients, I don't consider them uh, existing. So we have got this much gaps. Then the anesthesia, uh, unlike uh, most other countries, uh, most of our cases are being uh, uh, managed by anesthetists. These are BSC nurses or master uh, uh, level uh, anesthetic uh, trainees. They are not uh, medical doctors. So they usually they are the ones who manage uh, most of the cases, including laryngectomies. We have been doing them uh, with them. But nowadays, because of uh, the intake of more uh, doctors to the training program, so we have uh, many uh, anesthesiologists and we are becoming more comfortable, but still we are doing things with anesthetists and uh, they, were, they were good enough, I mean, with its uh, limitations, of course. The scope of practice in the head and the neck. So still like anywhere else, thyroids are the, thyroids is the commonest uh, uh, surgery that we do. And uh, before like maybe, 10 years or before six, seven years, significant number of mucosal malignancies, uh, or of, uh, oral cavity tumors, laryngeal tumors, and nasal tumors, they have been managed by chemo radiation alone without uh, surgery. So, but when this head and neck people, uh, the trained head and neck uh, surgeons come and uh, we had also, we have also some experts who are practicing head and neck uh, oncology surgeons and others. So when it starts to do the surgery nowadays, it's uh, like you can have adjuvant chemo radiotherapy, but surgery is being practiced. But before a decade, this was like, you are diagnosed with laryngeal say, then you go for chemo radiation. There was uh, nobody doing uh, laryngectomy that much commonly. I have heard that there were uh, some group of surgeons who were doing that but uh, it was not a common practice uh, by then. So expiracy surgeries are almost the same. Uh, one of the challenges, one of the problems that we have is uh, our multidisciplinary involvement uh, is very poor. So in a hospital, if you have got a case who needs uh, neurosurgeons, uh, head and neck surgeons and vascular surgeons and multifacial surgeons, whatever, usually, it's very much disorganized and it's only one team to the procedure. And then, you know, you can see how much uh, deficient it would be when you compare it with the ideal uh, thing which has to be done. So we have got this uh, problem in multidisciplinary uh, involvement, like scalable tumors, for example, uh, because of uh, sometimes, of course, because of our limitations in the skill, usually it's, uh, People, I mean, the neurosurgeons go transcranially and then you can see how much it costs. Vascular tumors. So the, we can, it would have been better to do it with, but the, for example, carotid body tumors and very big vascular tumors in the neck. So it would, it would, it would have been better to do it in a multidisciplinary way, but usually it's one of the team do that. And then you may have 
you know, uh, the outcome may not be as much as it uh, should be. It's uh, fragile too much as well. So one of the big effects that we have, one of the big drawbacks that we have is uh, the reconstruction part. The most common constructive part that we use is in the head and neck, the local original flaps, like the fake flap, deltoid flap, and the like. Otherwise, it's uh, it's not common to use other types of flaps, especially the free flaps. So what's peculiar about head and neck surgery in Ethiopia is uh, one, the thyroidectomy. As you all know, when you do thyroids, usually you do like uh, total thyroidectomy or hemithyroidectomy and the like. But uh, in our practice, you know, it's it's a very, I mean, it's one of uh, uh, challenges that we face during the surgery. If you, if, if, you, if you have a patient, for example, let's say you have patients with Graves disease, which is not uh, like, which is not being uh, managed with the, medic the medications. So when you want to do total thyroidectomy, you say, oh, what if they don't get levothyroxine on market? It's possible. You may not have levothyroxine as a in the country. What about, what if the patient cannot afford? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not expensive, but you know, our socioeconomic status is very poor. So what if the patient cannot afford it? And then what if he just leave the, I mean, stop taking the drug? So you have to consider all these things before you do, or before you practice what you uh, read from the uh, Western textbook. So usually what, because of this uh, limitations, usually what we do is, unless otherwise it's malignant, we, we, we prefer to do uh, subtotal, uh, thyroidectomies so that they kind of functional tissue and uh, avoid taking off levothyroxine. When you have uh, patients who need radioiodine treatment or who needs uh, 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 nuclear, I mean, who needs uh, diagnostic uh, uh, radioiodines, we don't have any nuclear med. We had a nuclear medicine department in, uh, in Addis Ababa University but I'm not sure whether it's function, at least not functioning concerning the radioiodine treatment. So we usually do the surgery, we do the, when it's malignant, we do the neck dissection and then we just follow them. We don't give them radioiodine uh, treatments. So that's also very challenging. So you may see patients uh, coming back after a few years. During surgeries, whether it's thyroid or parotids, we don't have nerve stimulators or monitors. I don't think that uh, even, most of uh, my colleagues have this experience of uh, using nerve stimulator or monitor in their uh, one once I mean one time in their practice. So it's a fancy thing for us. So we just trust our clinical skill. Magnification, or most mo most of us don't use uh, mag you know the loops to operate on the uh, neck or whatever in the head and neck. So uh, we usually use our necktie. So because one thing we are not trained during the residency program, and we don't see actually much of our mentors as well using this uh, magnifier, I mean, the loops. So we just use our necktie. Parasitectomy, as we said, we don't have nerve monitor. So you can see how much, like, you have to be a decision maker, like, is it a fiber, is it a nerve? You, you don't test it, you just, you know, you just cut, I mean, just pray and cut it. <laughs> so you have to be more reliable on your anatomy skills and I mean, anatomy knowledge and uh, your uh, experience. So to make things worse, you can have uh, some traditional healers applying some herbs with a very big scar on the parotid. So when you take out the skin, then you have to use uh, flap. And that's also another challenge for uh, somebody who is on the uh, learning curve. Concerning laryngectomies, uh, we have many patients who need uh, uh, who needs laryngectomy. So uh, we do that, and uh, the one of the things is that usually most of them are malnourished patients. So we don't have a research what causes the laryngeal C, but usually they are malnourished patients. And as you all know, doing like seven or eight hours surgery in a patient who is malnourished is I mean. It's difficult, and the post op uh, the post op days will be uh, also, you know, they are at risk. But luckily, I mean, we don't have much 
like fistulas or much complications after the surgeries, despite the feared malnourished status of uh, uh, their body. Tracheostomy tubes, you don't find it right and left, even if it's life-saving, it's like you don't get it in every pharmacy, you don't get it even in the hospital. So people have to look for metals and plastic tracheostomy tubes. So it's just a very, very uh, challenging that we face every day. After doing laryngectomy, we have never uh, rehabilitated their voice. So whether it's transophageal stress or electrolarynx, I mean, our patients, it's just like, there is one or two patients that I know who use electrolarynx, which is, I mean, we use electrolarynx. Otherwise, transophageal prosthesis for the patients, we, are, we don't provide, uh, it's just, uh, economic issue as well as awareness. So we, have to, we are working on these things to have voice rehabilitation because it's very important as uh, laryngectomy. When we have patients with tongue, uh, uh, say we need glossectomies, maxillectomy and uh, mandibulectomy, these are also very much challenges because you know our patients, most of our patients come late. So they need extensive surgery. And when you do extensive surgery, sometimes the local flaps may not, may not suffice. So you need to do three flaps and uh, and the like, which is appropriate management. But we don't we don't we don't do free flaps in the country. So uh, you can see how much uh, I mean challenging it would be. I mean doing nothing after you do my exam. Sometimes you may do you may put prosthesis, but you know some, even prosthodontics is it's 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 not um, practicing well. So again. You cannot do total glossectomy and send the patient home. So, for these cases, because of the absence of the free flaps, sometimes we even uh, prefer to send them for chemo radiation than uh, doing nothing or just cutting out and not repairing it. <clears throat> so, there are uh, when you have got defects in the face or in the head and neck, and then when you don't have. Uh, a local, local original flap which covers that area for some reason. So some plastic surgeon, I, I found this uh, uh, photos from uh, some of the residents, one of the residents uh, who were attached to the plastic uh, surgery uh, department. So they just take the forearm, the part of the forearm, the skin, this it's a musculocutaneous uh, flap. So you can see that there is a POP there just to avoid moving his hands now and then before the, you know, before he gets awake. Then after the full awake, they take this out and then the patient will take care of uh, this flap. So after six weeks, uh, you know, they detach it and they uh, put it there. Like, like what we do for forehead flap and the like. So I, I'm, I'm not sure most of you may not expecting this thing happening, but this is still happening I mean, currently. And then which time <coughs> the thickness will uh, resolve and then he will have uh, pretty good <coughs> cosmetically accepted, uh, accepted uh, uh, outcome. So doing maxillectomy and then uh, not doing uh, free flap, I mean, osteo-free flap or uh, prosthesis, that would be uh, really, I mean, that's not awesome. So uh, that's a very big challenge. <clears throat> the challenges that we have is like we have few surgeons, and these surgeons are, you know, they are young. So we are, we are on the learning curve. The access to head and neck surgeon is very much limited. So if a patient has got a tumor somewhere in the head and neck, to get access to head and neck surgeon, it takes months. And considering the doubling time of a tumor, you can expect by the time they come to you, as um, to the head and neck surgeon or to end surgeons, then it's late. So late presentation with, uh, I mean, with some to somebody on the learning curve, you can imagine how much frustrating it is. So that's that's a big challenge. So it's like it's rare to see uh, tumors at the very early stage. Usually you see it on the vocal cord tumors because there's changing voice in the very early stage and uh, 
uh, you know, they can present earlier. Otherwise, most of them, they use herbal medication. They use uh, some, uh, some, you know, spiritual things and the like. And then when by the time they arrive to you, that would be very much challenging. So most of them is not only excision, but it needs reconstruction. So you have to be equipped. You have to be fully equipped to do the excision and the reconstruction. And that's, uh, that's really challenging. And the other problem challenges uh, immunohistochemistry. Well, nowadays there are uh, there are uh, laboratories who send your uh, samples to somewhere and then getting the results back. But still, that's not uh, quite enough. It's expensive for the most of the people. So what we do is we do FNA and then we do biopsy. So the punch biopsy may tell you that that's uh, undifferentiated carcinoma, undifferentiated carcinoma. So you did, we do surgeries. It happened, like we had one patient with uh, oropharyngeal mass. We take a punch biopsy, turn out to be undifferentiated carcinoma. Then we do the, the you know, radical uh, tonsillectomy, we do neck dissections and the like. But when the result comes, I mean, after the surgery when it comes, it was lymphoma. So that was unnecessary surgery. And then uh, the same case happens where there was a, a patient with a nasal mass, which, is, which was really disfiguring his nose as well. So we take a biopsy, it says undifferentiated one. So we, take, we did medial maxillectomy with uh, you know, the forehead flap. And then when the result comes, it says lymphoma. So immunohistochemistry is, uh, it's really very important in, in head and neck, so, which we don't have. The, by, for that reason, we are missing uh, some patients. So we are <clears throat> exposing them to unnecessary surgery. <clears throat> Wards and OR tables, you know, I think that's a problem of most of the developing countries. At the middle of the surgery, you may not have uh, electricity. It may uh, get down and you may not have a generator. So you have to be aware of uh, this situation as well. I'm sure most of uh, our partners, if we are there, you may have not, you may have uh, faced uh, these problems. And water, if you don't have water, most of the drapes that we use, they are washable. So if there is no water, if there is no electricity, there is no autoclave, and then uh, you may have uh, this one cause of cancellation in the OR. So it's not, we are not in the, uh, we are not using the using through uh, drapes and the like. So everything has to be washed and come back again. So if there is electricity or uh, water problem, then we'll have uh, a cancellation. And one of the very, the very big challenges is the chemo radiation. We have currently, we have only one, uh, uh, one center for radiation, which is Addis Ababa University. So you can imagine 110 million people and one radiation center. So when you, after, even after surgery, when you send them for radiation, they have to wait for a year or something. So patients with malignancy cannot stay, cannot stay for days, I mean, after surgery. That it has to be you know, augmented with the radiation, but because of these things, it's really, uh, uh, our outcome is really being affected. Uh, the patients are being suffering from uh, these things. So, but chemotherapy nowadays, the government's taking actions to build like six big oncology centers in different parts of the country with, uh, with, uh, with latest uh, radiotherapies and uh, uh, big uh, you know, oncology centers. So that will definitely uh, decrease the challenge and the burden on the patients as well as on the facility in Addis Ababa University. So, but for the time being, we have only one radiation center. Which, which was cobalt, but now it is uh, IMRT. So uh, that's, that's unbelievable. And the health insurance, you know, we don't have health insurance. Nowadays it's being implemented. Otherwise, for, for example, somebody admitted to a government hospital. I mean, like 70%, 70 or 80% of our patients, they're free patients. They don't pay a penny to for the service. And uh, uh, even for those who pay, 
like for example if you go if you are admitted uh, having uh, maybe laryngectomy patient i mean from a to z like admitted pre-op then uh, surgery then post-op follow-up till discharge they may not cost them more than uh, 100 usd so it's almost free but even with that there are people who cannot afford like the CT scans, the investigations and the like. So the, the health insurance, I mean, it's being implemented. And if it, is, uh, if it really covers most of the people, that would, be, uh, that would be a good thing for our practice as well as for the patients. We don't have much research done our, on our practice and on our discipline in our country. So we really don't know the magnitudes uh, and um, uh, you know, the outcomes and the like. So we have really to do much about these things. What are the opportunities? Being, I mean, being an in surgeon in Ethiopia, we have limited hospitals with in service. So you have got a lot of cases. We have got a variety of cases. So you'll be exposed to that with all the frustrations that we have uh, uh, raised in the challenging part. So the number of surgeons are very much limited with very big backlog. So it's a huge exposure on the types and uh, varieties of uh, pathologies. And you can do any research. If you start to do like magnitude of something, prevalence of something, it's all open. I mean, it's just a virgin area and then uh, we have uh, that opportunity to do research, whatever research we have. No, nobody's touched it yet. And uh, above all, there is a trust from our patient that we get, even if you do not accessible medical errors. Well, nowadays, it's, you know, people are being aware of the medical legal issues and they are going to, they are going to the courts, especially in the other disciplines, especially in the OBGYN and the like. But in our case, usually, you know, the, I mean, it's, I mean, we can conclude that the trust of the patients is like, it's huge. So even with your medical ears, they accept uh, whatever is happening. And they are some, I mean, they don't go to sue you and the like. That will give you some, some kind of freedom to, you know, to challenge yourself and to give the service. So these are the opportunities that we have. So in the future, we are going to have uh, functionally fully equipped end centers with uh, well-trained advocate human power in most of the uh, uh, hospitals and the university hospitals, especially, and it's being, uh, I mean, like it's being equipped. Some of them are being equipped, so there is also human power uh, development in the training programs. So those things will be, I think, uh, uh, resolved uh, soon. And if we have early diagnostic facilities in the nearby uh, hospitals, then that will definitely help us to facilitate the service that we provide. This is what we are uh, uh, looking for. So social support, uh, because especially the, the insurance thing will really uh, help us a lot. So this is uh, what I have uh, as uh, ANT in Ethiopia and head and neck especially. So if you have any uh, comments or uh, questions to raise, I would be glad to, uh, to answer. Ilika, thank you for the uh, lecture. Um, you know, most of the people probably who are listening to this lecture or who will see it on YouTube really will have a hard time understanding the dynamics of healthcare in Ethiopia because they've yet to experience a system, perhaps let alone in Africa or Ethiopia. And <clears throat> um, Let's open this to some questions and then I'm going to share a few thoughts at the end. If, does anybody have any questions? Um, any question on any topic, laryngology, head and neck, otology, um, healthcare delivery, healthcare education in Ethiopia. Does anybody have any questions on anything? Uh, Lillian. Lillian was the young lady who the other week presented a case. She wanted to thank everybody. She says this is a great presentation. Um, Jorge from 
Asuncion Paraguay had to leave early. He also says in his chat here, thank you very much for the great lecture. Um, Oscar from Ukraine has a question. Oscar, go ahead. Uh, thank you, very, very nice presentation. I actually, I was wondering about the oncology service because you mainly mentioned the head and neck area. So uh, is the number of pathologists are also uh, quite limited in, in, in your country as well as other countries? Uh, yeah, so the, currently the total in surgeons in the country is near to 40, 40. So there is only like three fellowship trained head and neck surgeon. There is, there is uh, I think one uh, otologist, I mean, otologist, uh, Ethiopian native otologist. Otherwise, uh, there are five uh, ANT doctors who are being trained by uh, the program with uh, Professor Miriam from Chicago that I have mentioned. So it's not like a fellowship program that the government approves, but they do, you know, more of middle in surgery. So, well, if we consider them as autologists, yes, we have maybe five or six, but if we see real fellowship trained ones, uh, we have probably one autologist. Otherwise, most of the ear cases are being managed by the general in surgeons. All right, and, 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 and just, just one more question uh, regarding the private practice. Uh, is it common in big cities and is it expensive comparing to the, the, the public service? Yeah, so uh, yes, you are right. Yeah. So the almost, I don't know, maybe 80, 90% of the end surgeons, uh, they do private practice. Some of them have uh, their own clinic, uh, but most of us, uh, we go and uh, practice in, the, in general hospitals, in private hospitals, we practice ENT, uh, you know, we see patients ENT cases. But I mean, like the, in terms of uh, setup, in terms of availability of like, surgical equipment and the like, still the government hospital do better than the, the private hospitals, which is, which is surprising. But nowadays there are uh, surgeons who are investing more to, you know, to have a, very, a better uh, uh, anti clinics in the, in the city. So most of the end surgeons from the very beginning, they exist or they practice in big cities. And most of them, some of them have got their own private practice. Some of them as uh, practice in the private hospital. But almost maybe, I don't 80% of us were uh, primarily, we practice in the government hospital. Here in Ethiopia, you can practice private while you do a government hospital. So that's uh, the fact. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Um, any other questions? I'd like to share a few slides with you from Ethiopia. Um, this will stop another share screen. Okay, so. Here, hold on a second. All right, can you guys see this? Can you see this picture here? You look at, can you see it? Yeah, yes. I can see yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So let me tell you a little story. Um, my first trip to Ethiopia was almost 20 years ago. Hmm. And 20 years ago, the population of Ethiopia was just hitting 90 million. And as you look at said today, the population of Ethiopia is 110 plus million. Now, when you compare that to United Kingdom, it's two and a half times. When you compare it to Ukraine, it's, it's almost three to four, almost three and a half times the population. But the other interesting phenomenon is when I got there originally, there were only 15, <coughs> 15 ENT doctors, okay? Today, as you look at said, there's close to 40. Probably 10 of them are still from the old school. They trained outside of the country. The rest are trained in Ethiopia. And they have a different mentality and a different training level than do the current graduates in Ethiopia. Um, 
what we see and know to be benign disease in many countries, in Ethiopia, <laughs> but you go to Southeast Asia, you go to Africa, you go to any developing country and you will find benign disease presenting as a malignant disease, not because of its invasiveness, but because of its growth and size. And the growth of these benign tumors or masses will cause a life-threatening condition. Here's a young boy. This, these are pictures I just put together five minutes ago. These are pictures from the first time I ever went to Ethiopia. And uh, this was a kid who had fibrous dysplasia. And you can see, he's had a little surgery here too. Um, but what was this kid with fibrous? No, excuse me, this is not fibrous dysplasia. This was, I think this might've been a kid who had um, an ethmoid sinus disease. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I don't have the CT scan. Now going back to it, this is a kid with fibrous dysplasia. Okay. Here's another gentleman, an older gentleman, a large amount of cranial fibrous dysplasia. Okay, you see, you see a lot of it. Um, I'm not sure if there's a higher incidence in Ethiopia than compared to other countries, but I've seen the majority of it there and as well as a, a few cases in Cambodia. What you also find, you find ear disease that has gone so long that it presents with postauricular fistulas because they've had abscesses, they've drained. And you can he see here a young lady with a right ear with acute purulent material coming out of the fistula. And this is probably an inflammatory lymph node here, or it could be a Beeswell's abscess, okay? Yulika mentioned thyroid disease, goiter. You can see this lady, but the interesting thing about it is she's got tattoos on her neck. And this is the traditional medicine or witch, witchcraft, or you call it what you want, holistic medicine in Ethiopia, where they tattoo the thyroid thinking, or the skin over it, thinking that the, you know, it might help to reduce its size. And you can see these goiters get large um, if they compromise airway, these patients don't have access to healthcare. There's not like an emergency room um, in, in a lot of places where people live. Remember, we've got 110 million people. Only 5 million people live in Addis Ababa, the capital, where the majority of healthcare is available. Okay. And then I'm going to leave you with this picture. This was one of the first pictures I ever took. And I'll never forget it. it this was a guy who was, who was just you know, he couldn't walk anymore. He was just sitting there. Um, I don't think it was in Addis. I think it was in maybe Gondar or another, or, or another town that I was in. But you can see this gentleman has a fungating mass off of his left mandible, most likely a carcinoma. Um, and just, you know, he's, he's you know, he, he's not going to, get care for this. Um, so those are just a few interesting cases that I have seen. I just wanted to use them to kind of solidify what Yulik has shared with us today in his, in his very comprehensive lecture. Um, I don't really have much more to say. If anybody has further questions, please, um, please feel free to interject your question. Um, but, uh, you know, Ethiopia has a enormous, enormous, well, when I say enormous, you know, it's all relative, but they have a very educated professional group. Um, everybody who graduates high school is mandatory that they speak English aside from um, Amharic, which is the native language. And there's like, I don't know how many dialects, 20, 30 uh, of, in Ethiopia. But if, if somebody speaks English, and you can see Yulika speaks perfect English, my friend Nega is, I mean, th their English is as good as mine. Um, very, very, you know, professional class. Um, and, you know, it's been a pleasure for Global ENT over the 20 years to, to help them. I'll just leave you with one other thought. One of my first projects in Ethiopia was kids with laryngeal papilloma. They had no treatment for him. In the Black Lion Hospital, 
there were like 10 or 12 kids that were hospitalized for life because even though they had tracheotomies, they couldn't go home because there's no home health care and there's no home respiratory therapy. So they were stuck in the hospital. They were stuck in the hospital. They had school in the hospital. Their family had to come visit them. So one of the first projects was using a, a, a shaver debrider was able to, you know, remove laryngeal polyps. Um, and I was able to get like, I think eight or nine of the kids decannulated on the first round. Um, unfortunately, like most things, it, the project didn't continue. I, I don't know how many of the kids had to get re, retraked um, for regrowth, but um, you know, it was an it was a very very interesting time in my life. I'll share with you guys a video uh, later. I'll put it on the. Uh, you, uh, it's I think it's on YouTube. If not, I'll get Misha to do that. Anyway, you look at. You have any more comments for us? No more. I mean, I think we are running out of time. But just I thank you for the opportunity that uh, I get to, you know, to introduce the the practice in the country for my colleagues out there. So I thank you. No, we. But if they have any concern or questions, I would be happy to answer them with the WhatsApp group or whatever. Sounds good. Nega, do you have any comments? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Ilkan, for your well elaborated, very precise and concise presentation. And I would like to congratulate you to congratulate you also for uh, establishing the first postgraduate in the uh, study in Makale and. Your first graduation, the first group of ANT residents were graduated a few months back. And at this very moment, I would like to congratulate Dr. Dr. Ilkal. He did a very good job. And uh, uh, now he is also trying to do uh, also a nice job in St. Paul's Hospital. And again, I would like to thank also Richard for your uh, unlimited uh, assistance to, to, to help us. And I hope with all the limitations we have, with all the challenges we have, we need your support and hopefully you will uh, help us in all possible ways you can. Thank you again. All thank right. You, thank you everybody for... Uh for coming, Nega, thanks for your comments. You look at thank you for your lecture, uh, people with their questions. And in Hamarok, the word, you know, thank you is, and see you later is amaseganalo. So everybody, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Have a nice day. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.